I have a really important question for you, Marte. Can Croatia beat Argentina tonight? Oh, you're asking the wrong guy. I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> oh, I dear. think that car guys say the only sports where you need uh, two balls is motorsports. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great answer. Yeah. It, well, here's the thing. So it's a company that isn't even 10 years old, as you say, in Croatia, not perhaps that well known for, you know, hypercars, supercars, any cars. Any cars. Um, well, there was one a while ago, but we won't mention that one. And um, I just want to understand where does it come from in terms of getting the talent? Clearly, you know, you're a smart guy, but, you know, any... Any business is a team of people, as you readily and often acknowledge. So where, where have your people come from? I think you've got something like eight or nine out of 10 of that 400 people are from Croatia. Yeah. So how, how has this all come together, Mate? Well, Croatia has also uh, much lower salary levels than, than Europe. Um, so until recently, we couldn't afford to, to attract foreigners. Um, so until recently it was 100% basic Croatia. Uh, now we have like 15% foreigners from 26 uh, nationalities, which we are very, very proud of. Uh, and we are trying to attract more. But basically how we have done is, uh, luckily this, what we have done is, is new for the industry as well, or mm. was new for the industry as well. So um, like we couldn't be good at making a door or a light or yeah. a seat. You know, that's something that companies were doing for decades or, or 100 mm -hmm. years. Um, but with, with battery systems and electronics and those kind of things, they could afford to have, you know, to start from scratch because everybody was starting from scratch pretty much and learn and, you know, make a mistake and learn and so on. So we, we had this culture of just like, we can do it. Like, wh why wouldn't we be able to do it? You know, let's try and we screw up and we do it again and we do it better and we learn. And in places like this, you know, our guys are here running around and looking at all the details and learning things that they, yeah. they wouldn't be able to learn just by sitting in our company. Yeah. So there are different opportunities and, you know, today uh, knowledge is more available than it ever was. Of course, you still have to do a lot of the development and testing uh, on your own. Mm. But I think the basics, you, you can catch up uh, pretty quickly and if you give your people the freedom to to just learn they don't have to have huge backgrounds um, well there has to be a balance so of course yeah. a few senior guys are always good to, to teach the, the younger um, people but I'm, uh, I'm glad you said that because I'm 60 <laughs> and you're 30 so I'm, I'm relieved to hear that yeah 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 so it's impossible to build up a team even in a in a location like Croatia where you know you have uh, universities that give you some basics yeah. And enthusiasts, people that really want to do this. Yeah. Um, and, you know, then we just do it. Yeah. Um, well, the other thing there that struck me, I think just when you were closing, you, you were explaining it, the fact that um, the, the teams work physically close to each other. Mm. Whereas if, you know, I've worked in some big OEMs and I'm not an engineer, so, so all of this stuff is like voodoo magic to me. But the fact that you often have in big OEMs big teams of people in, in all sorts of parts of, uh, even within the engine group, you know, all sorts of different things. They often don't know each other, let alone meet together. Um, do you think that that is a really key part of how you've done what you've done and done it so quickly? Oh yeah, definitely. That's, that's very important. I think uh, things that might, some people might think are um, irrelevant, like for example, the space, yeah. the, the facility itself, that, that's I think really, really important. Uh, well, we are now in a facility where we have started when we were 12 people and now we are 400 at the same location, so mm. it's a complete mess and I want to build something from, from ground up. <laughs> um, so, but, but I think those kind of things are really important that the people can collaborate, that they have the right tools and right you know, short pads um, and not, no bureaucracy. Um, can make decisions quickly and I'm not saying that we are perfect there. We also, as we have grown, some, you know, the organization <clears throat> hasn't kept up always. So. We have to also do things in a different way to, to remove some barriers and so on. Uh, but I think those things are really important to keep everybody together. Um, I think that's, that's quite... Because if we had, for example, the, the battery development team in one country and the powertrain development team in another one, it would be very different. The result, mm. I think, would be very different. I, I think, personally, for OEMs, 
even the really big ones, and yes, they've got a lot of people, I think there's a massive lesson to be learned in this in terms of reintegrating things. And interestingly, I went to a Daimler launch of an electric truck a while ago, and one of the ways in which they said they'd accelerated that project was to essentially build a little kind of startup team, and, and they kind of locked them away in it. Well, not literally, I don't presume, but um, put them in a, in a certain facility where they kind of had to work in a totally different way. Which is to your point, I think. I think that BMW did something similar with the AI project. You probably did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, listen, I, I would be shot by people I know really well. And by the way, the guys at um, Fully Charge, Robert Llewellyn and, and, and Johnny and whatever, they've just said, make sure when you see Matty, tell him, you know, unbelievable job with Porsche. That's congratulations on that. I think that needs another big round of applause, by the way. You know, to, to be a 30-year-old running a business that's not even 10 years, and to, as you explained it, the first time ever Porsche, in my estimation, probably the, the most highly revered, beautiful manufacturer of, of, of machines, um, uh, to, to have got that acknowledgement is amazing. Can you tell us any more about that, or is it all now dead secret, top secret stuff? No, I think, uh, you know, it's obvious that the manufacturers are moving to electrification, mm. hybridization, electrification, especially Porsche and Volkswagen as a group. But Porsche has been quite um, closed in a way that, like, you know, we are big Porsche, like, we don't need anybody else. Yeah. And, like, they were developing all of their technologies internally, then some of the components were produced by uh, T1s. Um, and in the beginning, they were also like that. Why would they need to create a little company? And then we prove them uh, through projects that we can do, you know, before they make a decision, we, we can already do it. Mm. Um, and I think that's really what, what they wanted to, to get, like uh, a small, nimble team that can do things really fast, uh, like the speedboat. While yeah. well, for us, it's a great win-win because who, who better than them to help us get to a level from, you know, from the low volume production that we now have and prototype production basically to, to a series tier one with all the requirements. You know, it's a very different animal when you produce uh, a few hundred units for Aston Martin and Koenigsegg yeah. and so on. And when you produce thousands or tens of thousands of units for big OEMs where, you know, this is not bumpers or, or, um, or seats. If something goes wrong, if you screw up uh, with the battery, then people can die. Yeah, so, yeah, and serious. with the powertrain, you know, you, you have two motors and one axle, if something yeah. goes wrong, so functional safety and all of that, and reliability and cost, it's a big cost factor, so it's a very big challenge, and especially trust, that the OEMs trust a small company that didn't exist before, with a young team and so on, all of that is, is quite, quite uh, extraordinary, um, and we still have quite some time to get there, but I think it's a win-win, so they get a fast a moving company that has already some experience in the field where they want to go high performance EVs, well, we get a partner to help us accelerate to that. Yeah, well, my, my friend Adam Hammond in Australia, who's a lifelong Porsche fan, he's owned loads of them, whatever, he says, this is the best thing they could ever have done. This, like, catapults Porsche right up there and leaves everybody in a trail of dust, a bit like your cars do. Um, and, you know, uh, can we just qu quickly talk a little bit about the C2? So that's quite an extraordinary th machine. You're going to make, I think, 150. Yeah. It's got, uh, what, eight cameras. It's got LiDAR. Yeah. It's got a whole bunch of sensors. I mean, it's just... And when an, I don't know if everybody's seen this particular car. I know you saw some video at the start, but in Geneva, it was just looking at like the most beautiful creature you've ever seen as a machine. Um, and I love the picture of you with the Porsche guy. Forgive me, I, I don't have his name in my head, but but he, he's you're standing there with him, and he's just like, hmm, that's <laughs> lovely. It's it's just it picture paints a thousand words. It really really does. So what what more can you tell us about C2 then? You know, we, we want uh, with our own supercars to really show, showcase technology. So mm. we, we are not in the business of making flashy, you know, uh, toys for rich guys. Of course, it's, it's in the end a very, very expensive car. It's 1.7 million. Um, that it needs to be because of the low volume production and because of all the technology it's going into. Yeah. But really want to show, um, you know, everything that today is possible. So when, when I was starting 10 years ago, People were uh, seeing electric and uh, like racing as totally conflicting. Yeah. Um, and now the same, like when we announced that we are working on, on autonomous, they were like, wait, sports car autonomous, again, conflicting. Mm. So on one side, we have the electrification that's already proven to, to 
add to the performance and so on. So already people know any uh, drag race where a Tesla is, it will blow every, everything out of the water, yeah. not even to mention our car. Um, so the, the C2 is literally the fastest accelerating car of any. We'll see about the Roadster, uh, so it will be uh, uh, quite close. So any gas-powered car will be left behind in terms of acceleration and power. But also what we want to, to show is that autonomous driving can actually add to the to the ex experience, like uh, it can get you on a track and drive for you two perfect laps, and then you take over, and it uh, helps you to keep within the limits, tells yeah. you when you have to break, when you have to turn in, what you did wrong, what you can improve. So having like a professional racing driver sitting next next to you and guarding you in some way uh, on the road if you are taking it a little bit too far. So mm. th that's kind of the mix that we want to achieve, like. Uh, globally homologated, you know, safety on the highest level, high performance uh, supercar mm. with all the technologies that you can imagine. Mm. And I think in fairness for, for people that, that don't know, if you look at the origin of Formula E, the electric race series, um, your, 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 your car, the, 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 the Concept One was the race director's car right at the very beginning. And if you look at the evolution of that series now in the fourth, uh, fourth series, one more to come, um, and look at the electrification of motorsport in general, rally, you know, Formula E itself, um, exactly what, what you're making. I, I think people can see that motorsport is, have, is being revitalized, both in terms of this move to electrification, but also the classic cars. You know, it doesn't diminish um, having combustion engine vehicles race around on a track. I mean, and I Robo race will be very exciting and interesting. Well, it, indeed. So, so yeah, again, again, if no one's familiar with Robo race, you, you mentioned that this is extraordinary. So this is a guy called Dennis Ferdlov, um, his team of people, uh, they operate out of the UK, who I know you, you, you work with, are basically making um, electric robot racing cars. You have to see it to believe it, because saying will, those words, it, it's kind of, that's not real, and but it is. People say, you know, many people say it will be boring to watch a racing series without drivers and so on, but there's plenty of racing series with, yeah, with drivers. So, there are. And it's everything, yeah. it's all about <laughs> the guy, the one guy who is yeah. at the steering wheel, but there is actually a huge team behind it. Yeah. Um, so I think that the uh, Robo Race series will be really exciting, especially for tech Nerds, like I, I can't watch Formula One anymore going around in circles for two hours. Yeah. Uh, but this, this will be really, I think, exciting to see how AI and technology can really master some challenges, which is not going just to be driving in a circle, but they will also have some interesting uh, twists to that. Yeah, yeah. So, so again, I think you, you're referencing a point that when you look at companies like McLaren, uh, and we had Williams here, here yesterday talking about the, the, the extension of that technology into other things. You know, Williams were talking about aero, where they're putting aero on fridges to, to recirculate the cold air in to make them more efficient. Things that are nothing to do with glamorous, expensive race cars, to your point, about how that technology feeds out into the, the greater industry. Absolutely. For example, we have made a, a wheelchair battery that gives people, disabled people in wheelchairs 10 times more range than their original battery, and instead of replacing a lead-acid battery every year, yeah. you can keep the same battery for 10 years, so not wasting this, you know, uh, creating this huge amount of waste, uh, toxic waste every year. Yeah. So um, from, from a 2,000 horsepower supercar yeah. to a wheelchair and everything in between, it's applicable. I've got some friends in wheelchairs, so can they go 0 to 60 in 1.8 <laughs> seconds? <laughs> Theoretically. <laughs> that would be fun. I've been very greedy because I've been asking all the questions, but you know, forgive me for that, um, being a bit of a fanboy. Um, are there any questions in the audience that, that we've got handheld mic? Anyone who wants to ask anything? Um, uh, I'm more than happy to carry on asking questions, but if anyone's got something, have anybody? Yeah, is there one over there? Hi. Oh. Is it? Hi, I just wanted to ask a question, and obviously, um, uh, you're so inspiring. Your your whole story is incredible. Uh, can you take me through a little bit of the design process behind the motor, and what are some of the the largest, like the biggest problems you have or you face when designing it? For the motor, particularly. Uh, well, power density is a big topic. So, uh, well, for us, it's the number one topic. Uh, so, there are, I think, some very interesting designs that the engineers have come up with and uh, think it's possible to make them, but then in the end, to actually produce that, 
that's I think quite a challenge uh, with all the production processes and to get that into some kind of uh, scalable production. That's that's I think uh, a big challenge. Um, then what what else? I would say that uh, it's it's also the the whole system. Like I mentioned before, um, we can't anymore look at the motor. Uh, on its own, I think the motor is um, quite. quite well, I think the powertrain ne really needs to be looked at as, as a whole. So the inverter, motor, and gearbox, with together with the battery mm -hmm. in terms of voltage, um, has to be looked at as as one single unit. Uh, also because of now silicon carbide uh, technology, which has some impact on the windings of the motor, on the insulation, and so on, uh, which is also a challenge. So another challenge is that the the DV, DT, right? I'm not sure if I'm saying the right thing. So I'm 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 the CEO of the company. I'm not uh, so much involved in the in the development anymore. But I think uh, th these two factors. So basically, getting the the great ideas of the engineers into production, and uh, looking and integrating the whole system uh, as much into into one unit and making the making the trade-offs between gearbox, motor, and inverter because you have to make uh, trade-offs. So where do you trade off? Where do you reduce the, the weight and complexity? Do you reduce the weight in the active material in the motor or you, you reduce the active material in the gearbox? Do you have more torque on the motor but then have one gear instead of, or, or you have two gears or three gears but less active material in the motor and, and the inverter and so on. So these are lots of challenges that you have to take on from a vehicle standpoint. And I think it's really difficult to develop, a, let's say a car that, um, a high performance car that is, uh, not going like a trickle down from, from the top vehicle um, perspective, from the top vehicle uh, requirements to the component requirements. If you just uh, look at the motor itself or, or the powertrain itself without the whole vehicle requirements, how much uh, the tires can actually bring to the road, how much torque, how much traction they have, uh, what the weight distribution of the car is, how long the battery can sustain the discharge and so on. So um, I really think it's important to have this whole vehicle um, uh, vision in the head of the people working on it, um, understanding uh, every impact uh, of every choice, um, the impact of every choice you make on the whole vehicle. Wonderful. Do you want to pick one of those questions? Uh, Okay, so one easy one, uh, how much of the business is engineering services versus selling supercars? Um, one third is supercars, one third is the components. Uh, so it's not, not just engineering, but also components. We don't sell engineering hours, but our, our result is a system. What is the charging system for the C2? So we have a uh, 22 kilowatt onboard charger and uh, up to 250 kilowatt DC combo uh, fast charger. So with that, we can recharge in um, 35 minutes, I think, from zero to 85% uh, of state of charge. Mm. Uh, what can you tell us about the strategy of the Porsche, Porsche partnership? Um, well, the strategy is that we help them to develop um, their future products. Take-an, isn't it? The, the, the take-an, uh, Well, that's a little bit too far already. That's, that's okay, yeah. pretty much the development for that car. Is, yeah. yeah, yeah, It's soon going to go on the market, yeah. but there's lots of other projects, so especially in very high-performance projects, so on the tricky ones. And uh, that we also hopefully supply the components in their production, for, especially for niche. And in, in automotive terms, niche is everything below 20,000 units per year. So yeah. that's quite big for us. And on the other side, they will help us with the production lines and production facilities yeah. and so yeah. on. Uh, when do you see electric cars totally taking over? Uh, well, that's a very interesting question. I think actually that electric cars will be um, a consequence of autonomous cars. So, so do I. Uh, yeah. Because if, if you ask normal people right now what they think, how much range they need, they will say 50, 500, 600 uh, miles of range. Yeah, it's because, crazy. Yeah, because yeah. once per yeah. year they go to grandma. You Completely know, they, with you on that. Yeah, yep. so when, I, when I, I, I think that. And I think the timeline for EV adoption is there for the timeline for level five autonomy. Exactly. You know, and it, it's just that, oh, great. I feel really good now. Something this guy thinks, I think too. That makes me feel, I feel, I feel good about that. Um, a theme that's come out as well the last couple of days is uh, big, big discussions and, and varying uh, answers to um, solid state batteries. Would you like to say anything about solid state from, from your sense of things in terms of what you've been doing or you're planning to do? Well, I have my, my original notebook uh, like this from, from 10 years ago. Hmm where I wrote everything down. And in that notebook, is, you have the Panasonic 3.4 amp hour 18650 cell, 
uh, which is uh, today is still state of the art in terms of energy density. Mm -hmm. And I got like a thousand emails from people f uh, that I know and from the industry. Like, have you seen this article about a battery that recharges in five seconds? Why don't you use this? Have you seen this <laughs> article about the lithium yep. air battery and whatever? Yeah. Um, and I've been hearing the same story for, yeah. for 10 years, not to mention, you know, uh, yeah. like uh, the um, liquid, uh, you know, nano flow cell and stuff oh, like yeah, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, all of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, magic batteries. Yeah, magic yeah. batteries. So, well, uh, f there's lots of stuff in, in laboratories. Uh, what will really, like, and people focus on this one little thing that this battery can do better, like recharge in five yeah. minutes. But what about... Uh, it's it's uh, all energy? of them. It's the five or six or seven or eight things. Yeah. yeah. Safety, cost, energy density, yep. power density, all yep. of that stuff. Um, so I don't really see anything big happening so soon, like incremental changes, like with the form factor change from 18650 to 21700. Um, so it will, it will take some time. And we, we are betting on the, on the technology of today. Yeah, um, which is twenty one seven hundred currently. So yeah. the C one C two has actually twenty one seven hundred cells, um, and that's where we see the money being invested in, and that's yeah. for sure going to be the standard for the next five six years. Um, beyond that, really difficult to say, um, but yeah, we'll see. Yeah, because another man who makes pretty cars, Mr. Fisker, was here talking about solid state batteries and, and some other people. Yeah. So, so what does so he say? Is it real? Uh, well, it was interesting. He's, he's, if you kind of put a scale of like, you know, right out there, it might not happen at all, or it was seven to 10 years. Uh, Henrik's sort of a, like next Wednesday. No, no, in fairness, he, he, he's sort of 18 months, two years. Okay. I mean, he, 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 feel, he, he believes that the point of putting it into, into a vehicle on the road to test and validate, etc. cetera, but... Um, but if it's that timeline, then you have to have the cells already today. I, I completely with yeah. you, but, but so. I think the overall consensus of people far cleverer than, than me, and you know, a lot of in the audience have heard them, it's kind of five to seven years before it's in vehicle applications. And again, I think, going back to your point, five to seven years, that sounds familiar. Five yeah. to seven years. Years, yeah. level five technology, five to seven years. You can almost feel that there's this convergence of things that are in R and D state at the moment to that point five or seven years hence, where then we can just jump to owned electric autonomous vehicles and just exactly. leapfrog switching from a conventional owned vehicle to an electric owned vehicle. Exactly. Why? You know? Yeah. Um, and you will not care, like you don't care now how many kilowatts your tram has exactly. when you're going to a tram or a bus. Like, uh, even in Amsterdam, all the buses on the airport are electric. And I, as an expert, I had to really, like, is this really an electric car? Like, is this an electric yeah. bus? And I had to, like, look under the car, to under the mm. bus to see if there is an exhaust. Um, and, and I think that the same will happen in 15, yeah. 20 years with drive pods. Uh, people will not yeah. care anymore. And based on the data that Uber and all the others have. Yeah, that was good stuff. They will know exactly what kind yeah. of car and so on. Yeah, exactly. There's, a, there's another one there about, uh, um, yeah, c could you make a more affordable um, well, electric and mid-range car then? We not, because the supply chain, um, you know, again, example of Tesla, as far as I know, they have raised 14 billion until today, 30,000 employees, done it, lots of things right, and still, you know, they're just getting out there producing more affordable vehicles in that range, and there are plenty of other people trying to do that. We, we are not... We are not that yeah. company. It just takes a massive scale, supply chains and all of that, that we, it's just, yeah. we can't do that. And we are best in making high performance cars. Yeah. And we don't want to compete with our customers. It's funny you mentioned Tesla, because I, I see um, Marty Rimac as, as Europe's answer to Elon Musk, but with the ability to grow a much better beard than, <laughs> than Elon's ever grown. He only has one sort of under here a bit. So, so that's, that's impressive. Yeah. L listen, I, I truly could talk with Mate for all afternoon, and uh, I, I hope and I think most of you would would, would like love to listen to so much more. But we're going to see this story carry on. We're going to see much more announced as uh, that Porsche um, uh, partnership develops and uh, as the product goes down to um, different uh, locations to be shown to more and more people. Um, and I just would like to, again, um, congratulate Marte and the whole team um, in Croatia for getting to this point. I do hope you beat Argentina tonight because I'm English and anyone who beats Argentina is good in our view. <laughs> Only because the, the, the history of the football, nothing else. And um, yeah, oh, that was awkward. Um, but I, I just like to uh, once again uh, congratulate you, Marty, and thank Thanks. you very much for spending time with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.